me point you to this excellent paper in Ichikai 14 by Hayes and Ford about Turing test considered harmful. Um, is there anything to say after they, uh, after their argument? And I, so, yes, I think there is something to say, and I'm going to focus on more on the article itself, what Turing intended and uh, what he didn't intend. So I have basically two things, two steps in my argument, if you're going to call it that. I don't, one, step one, and uh, what I'm mostly going to talk about is that I, I don't think Turing intended to found an institution, which is what the Turing test has sort of become. And he certainly didn't intend to found a behaviorist institution, which is, I think, a good characterization of the, of the Turing test. And in any case, most of the discussion about this is by philosophers and by AI people reacting to philosophers, and I don't really think that's a healthy situation. So, um, Turing, I claim, didn't intend to change our vocabulary in considering the question, can machines think? So, uh, he was talking about AI, but I don't believe the phrase, of course the phrase doesn't occur anywhere in the paper because um, it wasn't coined till six years later. Um, so, uh, when he proposed to replace the question, can a machine think, with can it pass for a person in a teletype conversation, the question is what he meant by replace, okay? So if you take him to mean let's replace, you know, for all time the question, uh, can the machine think with, can it pass this test, then in some sense he was arguing for vocabulary reform. Um, and I don't think that's what he was doing. If you compare him with Skinner and Watson, the behaviorists, they really did want to revolutionize our, our psychological vocabulary. So they tried very hard to replace any talk of mental states with uh, talk about, uh, in behaviorist terms, um, and I say they try very hard, but most people think they've failed pretty miserably, and I agree. Um, so, um, Turing, however, doesn't talk that way at all, right? So, having, uh, he puts this paragraph in, which I think makes clear that he, the casualness of his intentions. He says, we may now consider the ground to have been cleared after some preliminary remarks, um, and we are ready to proceed to the debate on our question, can machines think? And the variant of it, can it play satisfactorily the part of A in the imitation game? I put this in brackets, but this comes from the previous paragraph, so it's pretty clear that's what he meant. Um, we cannot altogether abandon the original form of the problem. For opinions will differ as to the appropriateness of the substitution. In other words, we can't abandon the question phrased as, can machines think? Okay? And in the, in the next section of the paper, which I think is the most famous, his reply to potential objections to the question, um, he waffles back and forth. He wanders all over the place in the way he thinks about thinking. So, um, okay, he makes no attempt at all to, to say, well, in answer to this objection, if, if we simply rephrase the question in terms of, in these behavioristic terms, the question evaporates or the question changes completely. He doesn't say anything like that. If somebody objects, he goes to their turf and argues, you know, on their behalf, so, or argues against them in their terms. So, um, here are many of the ways, probably not an exhaustive list of the ways, that Turing talks about thinking in the next few sections of the paper. So, okay, he talks in terms of vocabulary shift, that's what I've already mentioned, you know, let's replace it with a different way of talking. But then when he says, one of the objections is, uh, you know, that people have souls and machines don't. That's a theological objection. He actually begins to argue theologically. Um, when he, uh, the objection from the incomputability of, of certain things, undecidability, and the inability of certain machines to answer certain questions, he um, talks about thinking as, uh, as if it's the operation of a Turing machine. Um, there's, a very, there's a fascinating point where they're talk he's talking about um, making uh, arithmetic errors and how a machine could be detected because it can do arithmetic so fast and he says the machine could deliberately, I believe that's his word, deliberately 
make mistakes in order to fool people. Now, there's a big difference between being programmed to act like a machine, where it actually believes it's a, uh, sorry, to act like a person, where it actually believes it's a person, and being programmed to trick people. So it believes it's a machine trying to act like a person. Those are two rather different things. And um, he doesn't, you know, he, do, he doesn't really care. He's not being very clear at all. Another way he thinks about thinking um, is as behavior is so complex, it is hard to discern the rules that could produce it, if any. And this is the issue we were talking about yesterday with the, the fact that the machine ought to be able to surprise you and things like that. Um, and uh, he even has an, he even answers the, the objection from telepathy, which he believes th th there is strong evidence for. So he believes people actually do have telepathic powers. Um, and the machine might not. That might give us a way of, of winning, you know, of beating the uh, Turing test. That is, you, you set up a telepathic detector and see if you can detect anything coming from the contestant. Um, and he finds an ingenious way out of that. Um, and then finally, he talks about it inevitably or practically involving learning. Um, and that's probably the most important part of the paper, really. He's talking about a substantive proposal for artificial intelligence. In very few of these cases could you actually try to replace the vocabulary uh, of thinking with this imitation game vocabulary and get anywhere. So it's clear that he wasn't thinking in terms of vocabulary reform in any way. All right. So what difference does it make what Turing intended? OK? It's not, you know. Um, you could say, well, he had a he had a clever idea, but it wasn't it didn't really matter. You know, it's it's what's happened to it since then that's important. Well, here's why it's important. If we read Turing's paper as the manifesto of a new movement, um, it's crucial whether this movement and all involved in it have implicitly signed on to the manifesto and therefore endorsed the behaviorism that's implied by the imitation game. OK? I think that's why it's, it's crucial. So a lot of philosophers, starting with Paul Ziff, have read it this way, as this kind of manifesto. And, um, the, and that's why so many of them have been determined to refute it. So I'm trying to argue that, he, that it can't be read that way. All Turing wanted to do was to shake people's intuitions up, and he was not really trying to uh, um, uh, revolutionize things the way the behaviorists revolutionized things. In fact, there was another revolution going on at the same time as uh, Turing's work and uh, his successors, and that's what's called the cognitive revolution in psychology, which occurred during the, the decade following to, uh, Turing's paper. Um, and which is more or less exactly the, the same time frame as the beginning of artificial intelligence. Now, um, if, Turing, if Turing's revolution was behaviorist, uh, then there's something very odd going on here because the cognitive revolution was said to uh, overthrow something, like all revolutions, and the something it was overthrowing was behaviorism or so cognitive scientists like to think. So behaviorism is characterized by refusing to think about the mental states of an animal, including a person, um, except the only model they, they would consider would be re reinforcement schedules. So that presumably is the only difference between one species and another, you know, et cetera. Whereas a cognitivist was and is willing to open up the brain and the mind and find modules inside it, find signals that are going back and forth. So it seems like the exact opposite of behaviorism. Um, so if Turing made us all closet behaviorists, then there was no revolution after all. Okay? And I think some philosophers like to say, you know, this isn't, you know, this is a, a phony revolution. They, they thought they were getting away from behaviorism, but they really weren't. They're still stuck in the same old mode, and they're missing qualia, and they're missing this, and they're missing you know, all this kind of stuff we're all familiar with. Okay. 
So I think it's, uh, so I think um, what I'm arguing here is if you read the original paper, you cannot support the kind of reading that makes it into a manifesto, okay? The, the paper goes into more detail on this. Uh, you can actually trace every time Turing uses the word think and see what he meant and so forth. And uh, um, please read the paper. It's better than the talk, <laughs> I hope. Okay. The second part of my argument is that uh, philosophers don't get to say what cognitive science is about. Okay? I'm, I apologize to, the, well, I don't apologize but to the philosophers in the room, but I sort of apologize. Um, I don't mean to be in, personally insulting or anything. Okay? So, what is the role of philosophy in cognitive science? Cognitive science is a, a, a very, you know, it's an odd institution. It's this alliance of several different sciences, and the alliance really doesn't stick together very well. You know, there's linguistics, there's uh, philosophy, there's um, psychology, computer science, and neuroscience. I believe I've got the, all the possible allies, but what? Anthropology. Anthropology. Okay. It's um, not at Yale, but maybe we just overlooked it. <laughs> we, uh, um, so uh, the, the cognitive science program at Yale is, I think, literally involves the departments I outlined before, but yeah, you're right. You, you can include other people in this. So, but it's a very that just makes my point better because it's a very loose confederation of sciences. They don't agree on methodology, and um, in you know at the end of the day, any given person who's an ambassador from a, a discipline will go back to that discipline to find um, uh, research that that he or she likes. You know that they approve of and are willing to uh, pursue further. So, what's the role of philosophy in this in this uh, in this uh, endeavor? Well, um, I think it does play a valuable role. I've, I've learned a lot from reading philosophy. I love reading philosophy, even when I disagree with it, which is most of the time, of course. Which, that's true for anyone. So, what I think the two of the things that it does that are valuable are it, it can clarify concepts by bringing in the usual, you know, anal analytical tools. And you can find subtle contradictions. Um, so uh, Hilary Putnam did a great job of showing that quantum mechanics, the, you know, the, the physicists were being way too complacent about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. It just didn't work. Um, and I think nowadays that's becoming, the, that's becoming much more widely accepted. Um, but when philosophy explores a priori arguments about an empirical issue, you know, can, can a machine think, which I think is an empirical purely empirical issue, that it's just really getting in the way. I mean, you, it's like Kant's favor, uh, famous argument that Newton must have been right about uh, space. Uh, there's an a priori argument that proves he was right, you know, and then it's a big embarrassment for Kantians when Einstein shows that he's wrong. Um, and there's a fascinating book called Leviathan and, and the Air Pump, which is um, historically very interesting about Hobbes versus Boyle, where Boyle was doing experiments involving vacuums, and Hobbes was saying, you don't need to do experiments. My a priori arguments show this, that, and the other thing about vacuums, and of course, Hobbes is completely wrong. Um, so what do philosophers bring to consideration of the Turing test? Are they clarifying any concepts? I don't think so. I, don't, I haven't heard anything get clarified by the discussion of uh, um, the uh, the paper, did they find any subtle contradictions? I don't think so, unless you count uh, Searle's wretched <laughs> Chinese room argument. But let's not let's not go there. Certainly not now. Okay. So um, conclusion: Turing's paper is of historical interest. Of course, it's a fascinating paper to this day. But it's not a charter or an oath that anyone must swear to. It's not coherent enough. It's a terribly sloppy paper, really. Um, uh, you know, it wanders all over the landscape with whatever Turing's been thinking about lately. Um, and uh, it's not relevant enough for that. You know, 60 years have gone by, and what uh, Turing was a brilliant man, but of course he couldn't anticipate all of cognitive science research in, over 60 years. So 
let's stop giving it this central place in thinking about AI. Um, one more addendum here, just, uh, just to point this out. I could easily have gotten to know Turing. This really pisses me off. Um, he would have been 60 when I went to graduate school, the age I am now. So he would have been still a young man. <laughs> um, and I'm very put out that I didn't get to meet him. Okay. So he should have had the opportunity to tell us what he intended many times over. But unfortunately, he died shortly after the paper. He, he almost certainly killed himself. And um, it's, as I say in the paper, this is just one of the many penalties the human race has paid for, uh, ha has paid uh, for its homophobia. So um, of course, the, um, the victims have paid a lot more than, than we have. But this really annoys, annoys me that um, cultural, cult our culture killed him before he could tell us to forget his silly paper. So on his behalf, I'm telling you, um, th uh, telling you that now. So thank you. Any questions? Yes, yeah. Darren. Okay, so uh, I feel a bit under attack here. Uh, Sorry. So, um, let me try and advocate for my people a little bit. Uh, of course, there's been a long history of philosophers trying to clarify the Turing test and to uh, try and explain very clearly that it's not behaviorist at all. And so uh, people like Jim Moore, very early on, Daniel Bennett, a little bit later, uh, have gone through and sort of shown that it's very clear it's not behaviorist. Uh, so I'd like to just point out uh, that the you have some uh, allies on the, on the philosophical side. I'm very surprised to hear you call uh, the paper sloppy. Uh, now, one of the reasons that uh, Turing, I think, was excited about his ideas is because he says, people have trouble defining the word think. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a specific proposal to replace all of this endless blabbering? And so I was just wondering if, if you think that there is some, at least something specific and concrete in the paper. Um, no, I, if you look at what he says later in the paper, he shows his hand much more clearly. He says um, that uh, he expects that by the end of the century, the 20th century, uh, A, there would be a machine capable of passing the, the test, um, and, but B, that the, words will, the meanings of the words would have changed uh, sufficiently that no one would any longer think it absurd that a machine could think. Now, um, I believe he's completely correct about that. That is, it's hard for us to remember what it, how silly it would seem in the late 1940s to claim that, say, a steam engine could think or something like that. That was a, the image of a machine or an internal combustion engine or something like this. Uh, even though um, Samuel Butler had proposed it, he proposed it on vague evolutionary grounds. It was not really... Um, you know, anything uh, detailed. So the idea of giant brains and whatnot, these were radical, uh, almost paradoxical ideas when they, were, when they came out in the, around 1950. So he, uh, he was try, Turing was trying to make an end run around these intuitions. And he, but he said, look, the intuitions are going to change. Right? So he did not intend, he, he really thought, what he really thought was that the, any such replacement of vocabulary, any such uh, testing, would be more or less irrelevant in 50 years. It would be swept up by events in such a way that you know, much more interesting issues would have come to the fore by then. Right? It's as if, it's as if uh, you know, someone had written, as if Dr. Frankenstein had written a paper on you know, defining life and had made some test. You know, if you can't tell the difference between uh, an artificial creature and a real creature, then that's, you know, it would be alive. Um, and then it said, but by the way, I expect in a couple, uh, in a hundred years or two hundred years that people will understand life so well that they won't need this silly definition. And you'd be, you would have been correct, right? It's like, we now understand life down to the last molecule in some sense. And um, I think that was the kind of, that was really what Turing believed. Uh, well, let me take one from. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. 
one side, on one side I uh, appreciate uh, your uh, provoking uh, effort to put the uh, paper of Turing down to a pedestal and uh, uh, surely it's a good way to uh, discuss more truly uh, aspects of the Turing test and uh, uh, especially I agree with you about uh, the uh, misuse of the test uh, as an intelligence test why it was exactly what Turing uh, was trying to avoid. Uh, but uh, uh, there is a line in your argument that uh, is not convincing to me. Uh, in the fact that uh, you uh, are trying to uh, interpret the genuine intentions of Turing, uh, and I'm sure that this is a, a useful. Uh, historical uh, attempt is uh, a, a very nice philological attempt. And maybe you are perfectly right in your interpretation, uh, but I don't see any points uh, in that uh, as a criticism of the use of the Turing text. Uh, it's sort of uh, uh, argument at the Verecundiam. Uh, I don't see anything fault uh, in uh, uh, misinterpreting, uh, the, uh, mishonoring the will of doing, uh, if in some sense this will be fruitful. Uh, again, sometimes ideas are brilliant also because they can be reinterpreted in a way that was not foreseen by uh, their uh, creator. Uh, and I guess it has been the case of the doing test. Uh, even if probably you're right that we will not agree with many of the interpretation. But, well, for example, in philosophy, it has been one uh, issue inside the discussion that possibly uh, set apart a very long problem that of the mind body that was so uh, coming in the philosophy. Uh, during uh, many uh, centuries and uh, well probably now even uh, better overcome by neurophilosophy but anyway uh, 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 I think it has been fruitful in their misinterpretations. Well <laughs> I don't let me let me talk about some of the misinterpretations or one in particular that really drives me nuts. First of all the Turing test is at most a sufficient uh, test for intelligence. So um, I think uh, uh, it, I could easily believe that AI could succeed beyond our wildest dreams in some sense and yet never produce anything that could pass the Turing test, simply because the machines wouldn't be interested, an intelligent machine wouldn't be interested in passing it or something like that. Um, so what the kind of paper that I really hate is, is the kind where they, uh, some philosopher shows that or argues that a, a, a certain kind of machine could pass the test without really being intelligent. And the classic example is that uh, a look, you could use a lookup table. Okay. Now, if, once you look at this proposal in detail, it, it is so preposterous. The lookup table would have to be larger than the size of the universe, et cetera. So that the uh, defenders of this, like Ned Block, have to resort to the idea that perhaps as a region of space-time where the laws of physics are different, so that little, you know, hyperspace elves could work away at rates, you know, that are faster and faster as they get smaller and smaller. So you could do an exponential amount of work in a finite amount of space. It's certainly a conceptual possibility that you could build this table, blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and there are all kinds of reasons why it just seems insane. Okay, now, why should we have to defend, why should anybody care that Ned Block thinks you could pass this test and not be intelligent, right? What, you know, what's it got to do with intelligence, really? Uh, any argument like that. And, and so that's why I think that, that the only way, the only reason why people believe that it might, they might have to defend themselves is they, they believe that this paper is very important. It's some kind of founding document. That's why the original intention is important, because I want, I want to show that it's not any kind of founding document. 
And therefore, there's no reason to take Turing's word just because he's some kind of saint and elevate it above everybody else's, so we have to defend it at all costs. Um, generally, I completely agree with, with what you say. Um, one of the points you listed in one of the uses of think that uh, Turing, you had Turing say was about deliberately um, misleading people. Yeah? Now, that's a very human thing to do, and of course would be a feature of the parlor game that you based the test on, like men are trying to pretend to be women by passing notes and stuff like that, yes. Um, to what extent do you think that Turing thought his test it was possible to cheat at? I, I, I get from reading it that he thought this was a sort of test that really you can't cheat, and if you achieved it, you've achieved something substantial, due to its nature. Yes, I, th I think he thought that, and I think he was correct. That's why these arguments that there's, there's some preposterous way in which you could cheat, you know, is, uh, th these arguments are, seem silly to me. But um, I think he just slipped. I think this was a mental slip of his when he talked about the machine deliberately deceiving. He, the way he put it was, you know, you could, the machine could deliberately make... Um, he said uh, arithmetic errors, or he, it could do arithmetic very slow, more slowly than it really was doing it, right? And as we know, all, uh, I believe all contestants in, in the Loebner uh, contest, for instance, um, do del deliberately insert typos and in things to avoid looking too machine-like, okay? But the deliberateness is on the part of the programmer, of course, the pro I think he intended that, 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 that this uh, machine would have its own deliberation and, be, and, and wish to cheat itself. I, I, don't, I think it, it, he didn't mean that. But the game is based on this, whereby men are trying to pretend to be yes, women. Right. And so right. and and the direct analogy is that you deceive all the time in that game, and your ability to deceive is part of the test. Right. So really, there are two Turing tests. And one, you, you have a machine that uh, believes it's a person, yeah. okay, and tries to convince you that it, it, it believes it's a per, it believes it's a person. If you ask it, you know, where, when were you born, it says it, uh, Peoria, you know, in, in 1973. Huh? Or there's another scenario where you take a general purpose intelligent machine that was designed to do something else like fly interstellar spaceships or something and say, uh, now sit down here, and I want you to try to pretend to be a person. You know, that's another, yet another test. Yeah, so uh, the point is, he doesn't make the distinction very clearly. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he really intended the latter, but it's hard to say. Yeah. But it's another example of, of how this is a pretty casual paper. I really don't think he was trying to make any deep uh, points about it, about anything. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, an observation. Oh, no, and, uh, an observation, a, a remark, and a question, basically. Um, the first observation is relates to your addendum, and that's that, uh, I don't know whether you're aware of it, about six months ago, the British government issued a formal apology on, on behalf of the government at the time for the uh, horrendous homophobic treatment of Turing, and that, that's now been addressed this in this country. And, and very good for that time, too. Um, the second, my second remark is sort of a clarification I'm looking for from your argument. It seems to me that the central core of your argument seems to be that, hey, look at these philosophers like Kant um, who've engaged in an a priori battle with a, with a scientist and, and, and ended up losing and ended up with egg on their face. Therefore, all philosophers are never to engage in this battle again. And it isn't clear to me how that follows. I mean, if we look at all the scientists who have made a wrong prediction, they will never do science again. So I, I'm not, I don't see the logical path of that argument and why that, that entails that no philosophers shouldn't engage with this. Sort of um, and I'll just finish my question while you're thinking about that. And the, third, and the question is, uh, is that uh, you... The, we, we asked our uh, the contributors to, the, to, the, uh, to this small uh, symposium to think about possible replacements for the, in Scarecrow's the Turing test as a, as a better yardstick to measure machine intelligence as we enter the 21st century. And I wondered, have you, have you any ideas on that? Well, of course, uh, 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 yes. We talked about this yesterday. And uh, it's a different topic. And uh, I, I don't think 
that what I'm saying is has too much bearing on it. Although I, I do believe that it's that it's much better to have tests of the form: Does uh, Agent A do a better job at a certain task than Agent B, as opposed to a test of the form: Does a, do Agent A and Agent B perform indistinguishably on a task? I think that's much harder to measure and get a level of significance at. This is a point made by Hayes and Ford, basically. Um, and, um, and when you put it that way, you get into a really different mindset. So I, I would recommend that. Um, we're out of time, and I've forgotten the original point. So <laughs> our, <laughs> we're not out of time. Quick question. This reminds me very much of the way the psychologists talk about Freud. He's in fashion, he's out of fashion, but there's, it was serious work. It wasn't a throwaway, but he himself then said, he lived long enough to tell his disciples, you're not disciples, this isn't a religious movement, we're trying to advance science here, don't take it all too seriously. Aren't we in sort of the same position with Turing? And following this discussion yesterday, maybe just as the Turing test, I mean, the test for intelligence shouldn't be binary, maybe the evaluation of whether the Turing work is worthwhile shouldn't be binary. And it isn't, I'm not... Um, I, 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 yes, of course, I, I agree with that. I, I, I have one question. That's prerogative. <laughs> ah, the chair's prerogative. <laughs> so, there were two, but I'll learn it to um, One of the things I, I see often when we start looking at artificial intelligence across philosophy, lot in se several times we stop at Kant when we have more interesting things that came later on in terminology and uh, the work of Diderot and much more of the contemporary philosophers. I don't know if you have views why, uh, even in philosophy books sometimes I'm surprised that talking about thinking and reasoning seem to be focusing too much on Kant and 